Having done this reading in a lot of detail, now let's take a look at its key takeaways. We started off with the various inputs that are required for any VAR estimation approach. These inputs are number one, the time series of profits slash losses. These, this time series, we computed it using two time series. The first of them was the time series of prices, if it's a listed instrument, or the time series of MTMs or valuations, if it's, let's say, an exotic product. The second time series was that of dividends slash coupons, which you can refer to as the income time series. So we computed the PNL as, let's say, the receipts at the end of any period T minus the initial investment investment let's say at the beginning of the period we then took a look at two ways in which we can let's say adjust this definition of pl for time value of money either by discounting the payments received at time t or by capitalizing the payments made at time t minus 1 both using let's say the risk free rate r we then moved on to defining two kinds of returns the first return was what we referred to as arithmetic returns. We calculated these by just taking in the PL time series, take the PL and divide it by the initial investment. That's an arithmetic return. Remember, this arithmetic return is something which you use as a proxy for the average or the expected return. The other kind of return that we took a look at was a geometric return. This return is for a chosen or designated time period and it takes into account reinvestment of this income and a certain chosen compounding frequency. So if you assume that your compounding happens with the continuous compounding, then I can define my geometric return as the log of the final proceeds divided by the initial investment. The two kinds of returns, arithmetic and geometric, can be linked to one another using this expression. Generally speaking, the two returns are close to one another if your period over which these returns are earned is a very small period, let's say a daily period. Then we also took a look at another time series which is that of losses. So I can create another time series which lets me call it as LP. I define this time series to be let's say the negated version of the PL time series. And if you are talking about distributions then we said that the mean of the LP distribution is simply the negated value of the mean of the PL distribution and the standard deviation of the LP distribution we said is the same as the standard deviation of the PL distribution. When it comes to the most sort of simplest technique for VAR estimation, we said it's the historical simulation technique. All that we do in this technique is we take the observations that are given to us, assume that these are let's say the PL observations, we sort them in an increasing order, then let's say from the smallest to the highest, smallest would therefore refer to negative entries or losses, and we pick the VAR at a certain confidence level, let's say it is C, or a certain significance level, let's call it alpha, as the N alpha plus 1th observation from the left. Here I'm assuming that I'm dealing with a PL time series, number one, and number two, I'm dealing with N observations. So if I pick N alpha plus one observations, uh, N alpha plus one -th observation, I should say, from the left, then that observation would clearly leave a probability mass of alpha in the left tail. Had I been working with the LP series, we had said that we will pick our VAR again to be the N alpha plus 1th observation, but this time we'll pick it from the right, okay? So this was about historical simulation. Keep this thing in mind that it's a very simple technique, but at its core, it makes this assumption that the future will follow the past. A very important benefit of this technique is that it accommodates real life empirical observed distributions it does not it doesn't impose any distributional assumption on the pl or the returns now let's move from this non parametric world which historical simulation was in to a parametric world in this parametric world we defined three approaches the first approach was one in which we impose as we do in any parametric approach a normal distribution assumption on this time the pl the profit and loss so if you do that, then I can calculate the VAR, which in the PL world, remember, is in the left tail by starting with the mean, 
moving to the left and that's why you have a minus these many multiples of your standard deviation of the PL and since we are talking about a PL and since var is a loss number we had negated it to create a var had this been an LP distribution you would have computed the var by starting with the mean which is mu LP and moving to the right this time by these many multiples of the standard deviation sigma PL is the same as sigma LP now moving on to the second approach in this category we called it the normal var in this approach we impose the normal distribution assumption on the arithmetic returns and let's assume that these returns are distributed normally with this as the mean and this as the standard deviation to calculate the var which in this case would assume that valuations or prices are normally distributed i'll start with the mean return move to the left and that's why there's a minus these many multiples of the standard deviation what this gives me along with the minus is what we call a var percent because it's like a var number for one dollar of notional invested this i have to scale it with the current valuation of my position which is pt minus one i'm assuming i'm standing at time t minus one and this gives me a var at this confidence level c the next approach in this parametric category was a log normal var approach. In this approach, I impose the normality assumption, this time on the geometric return, which is the continuously compounded return. If you do that, then we know that the prices or valuations are log normally distributed. And that's why we refer to this var as a log normal var. In terms of its var, calculation I should say how do we calculate it start with the mean return move to the left by these many multiples of the standard deviation this gives you some kind of a worst case valuation so current valuation minus the worst case scaled by the total size of your position this gives you the var keep this thing in mind that normal and log normal var are close to one another if the period over which they are being computed i mean the horizon is small let's say daily we then moved on to defining coherent risk measures that means let's say we have portfolios x and y and our risk measure is denoted by rho which is written we've written it as a function it's said to be coherent if it satisfies all of the four conditions listed here just to name them at this moment these conditions were monotonicity sub additivity positive homogeneity and translational invariance we described each one of them in detail in our videos out of these four we reasoned out that sub additivity is really important it's important from the standpoint of margin calculations if let's say the exchange uses this particular risk measure for calculating initial margins it's important from the standpoint of regulatory capital estimation if let's say the supervisor is using this risk measure for calculating bank capital and it's also important from the standpoint of setting a conservative upper bound to the combined risk of let's say many positions put together now in terms of how var fares on these conditions then remember that var is not a coherent risk measure the reason being that it does not always satisfy this condition of sub additivity by taking a suitable example we had reasoned out why this is not the case why is it i mean why is it not coherent now in terms of making var coherent then and you know making it sub additive i should say you should pick a PL distribution, which let's say comes from this family of distributions, which we call the elliptical distribution family. And this normal distribution, remember, is one member of this elliptical distribution family. We then moved on to this risk measure of expected shortfall. Now, this risk measure is something which helps you peek into the tail. The VAR only tells you a threshold loss number. It doesn't tell you how bad things can get if the losses were to exceed the VAR. In terms of how we defined ES, we defined it as the probability weighted average of tail losses. In terms of the formula, it's the expected value of the loss conditional upon this fact that the loss exceeds the VAR. So this is like a conditional expectation. When you come to the world of historical simulation, which is a very simple approach we know, 
And in this world, the ES can be estimated very simply by a simple average of all losses that lie in the tail. Remember, we had picked the N alpha plus 1th observation from the right if it's a loss distribution as my VAR. So if I can take these N alpha observations which lie in the tail and take their simple average, I arrive at the expected shortfall. Now, the expected shortfall we reasoned out you know, with a lot of detailed analysis can also be computed using another formula and that formula does not deal directly with losses in the tail but rather it deals with quantiles or we should say it deals with VARs which are computed at a confidence level that is higher than the confidence level for which we are computing this ES. These confidence levels which are higher than C, let's call them CI, I pick them which are you know, these are comfortably in the tail and I pick them as equi-spaced confidence levels. It's like I'm slicing the tail into N slices and then I sort of take an average of all these VARs to compute my ES. Now more are the number of you know, slicings of this tail, more accurate would this approximation be for the expected shortfall. At this point also note that if your losses are continuously distributed, I can write down two formulas for the expected shortfall. The first formula, remember, is like uh, an integral, it's like a conditional expectation, which looks something like this. It's 1 by alpha, run this integral from the var up until infinity, and then compute, let's say, x, fx, dx, where x refers to the loss. The other formula for this, which gives generally the same result as this one, is 1 by alpha. This time the integral runs over a probability. I'll run it from C, which is the level of confidence, right up till 1. And I'll do this integration as QP dp. Okay? So it's like I am taking in a quantile and I am basically integrating it over the probability values which span from C to 1. Both these integrals are basically computing an integral over the right tail, which is the case for the loss distribution. Now, let's move to more generic risk measures and we defined a measure which is like some kind of a weighted average of various quantiles. So if I run through various quantiles, I have ex you know expressed my quantile as QP. So if this is my loss distribution, then a quantile QP would be that number on the horizontal axis to the left of which you will have a total accumulated area of P. So if I can you know take various QPs like this and combine them in some kind of a weighted average way, then I arrive at a risk measure which I refer to as a general risk measure. The weighting function is this phi. You keep changing the phi and the risk measure keeps changing. We had said that both the VAR and the ES can actually be subsumed into this definition of the general risk measure by an appropriate choice of the weighting functions. So these are what are, you know, what is given here. Now we then raised this question, are general risk measures also coherent? And we said not necessarily so. To make them coherent, we move to a special subset of these risk measures, which we refer to as a spectral risk measure. This subset is one in which the weighting function satisfies three conditions. The first one is that these weights are non-negative. They can be zero, but they can never be negative. These weights, you know, in very layperson's terms, sum to one. That's like a requirement which we always impose on weights when we do a weighted average. In this world, since these weights are continuously defined, so it's like saying the area under the weighting function is equal to one. The last one is a very important condition. We had said if you are risk averse, then the weight that you assign to a certain quantile which is further into the tail, that means for this quantile P2 is greater than a quantile to its left, which is let's say P1, then the weight which you assign to a worse or an extreme loss cannot be less than the weight that you assign to a less extreme loss. That means, you know, drawing it visually, if this is P2, quite an extreme loss, and this is P1, then the weight which you assign to this guy cannot be lower than the weight you assign to this guy. So ES, it satisfies this condition, but VAR does not. So ES is actually a spectral risk measure, and it's also coherent. We then moved on to defining 
standard errors. So when we calculate VAR or estimate it based on a sample of observed, let's say PNL or returns, then it's like a statistical estimate. Every statistical estimate we said is is to be accompanied by some kind of a standard error estimation because if we have the standard error let's say it's for q which is a point estimate of war and i'm saying standard error is se of q if i have this standard error available with me i can easily use it to calculate or estimate a confidence interval for my var now Let's take a look at how we, how we computed this standard error. We had said, let's pick the quantile. We had used the case of a PL distribution. So my var was in the left tail. This was my var. We had created a thin strip around it. This strip had a width of H and we had computed three probabilities. The probability to the left of this strip to let's say the right of this strip and in the middle of this strip. Based on these three, we had computed the standard error using this formula. We had then done you know, quick rules of thumb in terms of how this standard error varies with respect to the size of the sample. So as the sample size increases, intuitively you could agree that the, the standard error decreases. Then the other determinant we had you know, reasoned out was the width of this bin. We had said as the bin width increases, the standard error decreases. And lastly, the determinant was the confidence level at which this VAR was estimated. We had said as you estimate VAR, which are let's say for higher and higher confidence levels, their uncertainty goes on increasing. That means the standard error for high confidence VARs is pretty high. We had actually finished then this chapter with a quick discussion of this plot which we refer to as a QQ plot expands as the quantile versus quantile plot. This plot is basically one which plots quantiles which are read from one distribution let's refer to it as an empirical distribution plotted against the quantiles read from a specified benchmark distribution. If you, what you achieve is a pretty linear graph, something like this, that means that the specified benchmark distribution is a very good choice to fit the empirical or observed data. If it's not the case, then you switch to another benchmark distribution and keep trying out different choices. The second thing which we noted about QQ plots was that if you plot this QQ plot and the extremities of this plot you see them bending towards a certain axis, then the distribution plotted on that axis has fatter tails. So that was my second observation. My third observation was that QQ plots, they can be used to somehow get a handle on the parameters such as location, which is another name for mean, and scale, another name for sigma of any distribution. If you were to do a linear transformation of one of the distributions in the QQ plot, then this transformation goes and changes both the slope and the intercept of this QQ plot. These changes in slope and intercept are the ones which can help you sort of determine the mean and the sigma of this empirical distribution. Lastly, we had the fourth point. We had said that QQ plot is a very good way of identifying outliers in your data. So this was a very quick run through of various takeaways in our first chapter, estimating market risk measures.